स्पीकर को ही म्यूट करके हेलो शिव सेर स्पीकर है शिव सिंह करके उनको भी सबको म्यूट किया है तो शेयर स्क्रीनिंग भी करा दो बट उन आई कैन डू इट इट्स फाइन हेलो सो गुड इवनिंग सर Sir, shall we? I think it goes in mute all the time. I think because I think that the setting is like that. No, uh, sir, it's on your side. Yeah, yeah, but it. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Shall we begin, sir? Yeah, you can. Yeah. yeah, I'll hand over to my president, branch president, Dr. Smita Shah. Uh, Shah, madam. मैडम मैडम यू आर नॉट ऑडिबल हेलो या warm welcome to all registered uh, delegates on behalf of isc kalend after successful uh, journal club meeting today we are moving towards our first cme on low flow anesthesia anesthesia technique has evolved from open drop ether to uh, open circuits semi closed and closed circuits and now with workstations with a very accurate uh, potent inhaler vaporizers but still we know that these anesthetic gases are very costly and they are uh, greenhouse gases and they contribute to global warming so to make it more economical and more eco friendly this low flow anesthesia has evolved but we uh, but we still have a fear in our mind that can we apply this low flow anesthesia in our setups so to elaborate more on this and enlighten on this we have invited today most eminent speaker dr shiv kumar singh and today uh, our young talented a uh, very dynamic uh, treasurer of uh, isc kalyan dr mayuresh patel is uh, going to moderate on this session so uh, dr mayuresh we are expecting much more lead for academic events in futures now i uh, re request dr mayuresh to uh, dr mayuresh to take over dr mayuresh hello yeah i am audible yeah yeah yes yeah hello good evening all of you uh, myself dr mahesh patil on behalf of isa kalyan uh, welcome you all on today's cme on a very interesting topic which is a also topic very much useful in our day to day practice uh, 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 low flow anesthesia and today's topic we have got a very excellent speaker dr shiv kumar singh sir uh, sir needs no introduction as such uh, he is uh, very well known to every one of us and uh, he is very well known in international faculty excellent tutor and mentor i have personally met one sir in tas group conference and uh, found that he is very much uh, helpful and approachable uh, so uh, i will just share little bit about sir uh, Uh, sir is consultant anesthesiologist at university hospital liverpool uh, and uh, he is chairman theaters anesthesia uh, uh, and he have keen interest in regional anesthesia trauma and vascular anesthesia and uh, education and training uh, we have uh, attended many lectures of sir and uh, he is very uh, very much into the academics 
uh, so uh, for today's topic uh, we will have uh, a lot of knowledge uh, regarding this uh, uh, low flow anesthesia uh, uh, if you have to tell about sir there are a lot of uh, information uh, so he is uh, basically uh, mbbs md from india uh, uh, aims and uh, he is consultant anesthesiologist at royal university now uh, practicing over there uh, he have uh, uh, lot many uh, previous uh, designations and uh, he is uh, having uh, many leadership and training programs uh, uh, also many guest lectures uh, basically maximum lectures on uh, regional anesthesia blocks and uh, uh, also uh, difficult airway uh and uh, also he is a, a faculty organizer in ultrasound uh, guided regional anesthesia workshop for trainees uh, and uh, uh, we are very keen to hear from sir about the, uh, this topic uh, low flow anesthesia uh, in between uh, i am a moderator uh, so in between if uh, there are any doubts uh, i will share with sir and uh, sir will help us uh, i uh, simply hand over to sir there are lot many things to tell about sir but uh, the topic uh, uh, will not be get covered so i will hand it over to the sir welcome you sir oh uh, thank you uh, mirish yes sir yeah. mirish stop uh, screen should i start screening my you can so Okay, so I will share my screen. So greetings from uh, Liverpool. And this is where I live. These are statues, uh, metal statues, hundreds of them in the sea. Uh, they call Anthony Bromley's another place. And on the right side, you actually see, it's called the Liver Building. And it's, uh, there's a bird on the top of the building and the Liverpool city is named after the, this mythical uh, bird. So there are actually mythical creatures in UK as well. <laughs> India has got lots of mythology, but the UK too actually has got some. And uh, congratulations, uh, first of all, uh, to uh, you know, Kala and her team uh, for the Indian Society of Anesthesiologists, uh, city branch, uh, Kalyan and uh, ISA uh, for inviting me to this uh, lecture. So I'll be talking about anesthesia workstation and low flow anesthesia. And um, I have tried to simplify it because uh, if you actually read about low flow anesthesia or talk, think about workstations, uh, they're too complicated uh, for people. And, and that's what I think uh, uh, they, you know, when somebody says, can you tell me something about workstation? They go, oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's such a complex machine. Or uh, uh, you talk about low flow anesthesia. I say, oh, there are lots of equations. Yeah, those all equations and things I'm going to take away from that. So I'm going to simplify it and make it a lot more understandable for people who don't use low flow anesthesia or who do not understand it. I'll try to make it simpler. So before we actually go into the low flow anesthesia, I'll talk about the workstations like a little bit. So what is the difference between an anesthesia machine and a workstation? Okay, I actually see uh, people posting uh, machines, some old machines. Some sometime back, there was someone who actually showed some machine which was actually fully rusted. Uh, I mean, these are uh, basically museum pieces, but I mean, they have very important, you know, historical, uh, value, uh, knowing how everything has evolved uh, from, because if you look at the basic uh, anesthesia machine, the things are very similar, and I will let you go through that. The machines have evolved over a period of time, they have become a lot more complex, uh, the vaporizers, you know, ether bottle, you can see ether bottle, ether bottle has been replaced by, you know, tech vaporizers, and uh, we have different uh, breathing systems, uh, you know, a lot of one of the things for, obviously for low flow anesthesia is having a, uh, you know, circle system. So which has got sort of line as part of the component. Now I have taken lectures on basic anesthesia machines. If somebody wants to go through them, they can actually go through 
that on the group or on my YouTube channel. So slowly and slowly, the machines actually started becoming a lot more complex, you know, more electronic. Uh, there was more of computers uh, added to the machines. So from being as totally pneumatically driven machines, they became a lot more complex. So that's the anesthesia workstation. And you can see that it's got monitors. There is actually a system for, you know, uh, automated anesthesia chart recording what you're giving. Uh, so lots of things uh, within the, so it looks a lot more complex than a simple boil machine. And there are different workstations that people, people ask, okay, which is the best workstation? There isn't actually a best. Everything is, everyone is going to say, so you go to the uh, Mindray guy, you say, oh, mine is the cheapest and the best workstation. You go to Draeger, say there's nothing like Draeger. You go to G, they say they, will, they are the best. Okay, there are just subtle differences between those workstations. Okay. So basically, anesthesia machine is the main component of any workstation. So you have gas delivery system. There'd be mainly in big hospitals, they you likely have pipeline, but also there are cylinders at the back of the machine. Then they go through the flow meters, then from flow meter to vaporizers, and then to the breathing system. There might be a uh, you know scavenging system, uh, which should be which very very important, and there would be an interface with ventilator as well. So that's, that's the basic anesthesia machine. So if you look at that uh, schematically, you have a source. So source of your gases, whether that's uh, nitrous oxide, oxygen, air, uh, that could be from pipeline or cylinders. And then it goes to flow meter, vaporizer, breathing system, and, and then there's a breathing circuit uh, to the patient and the scavenging uh, part of it. So what is anesthesia workstation? It's basically your anesthesia unit, which I'd call everything which I've described, plus the advanced ventilation system. Okay. So they are got ventilators. Some of the ventilators are actually as good as IT ventilators. So they give you, you can have SIMV more, pressure control more, uh, you know, ASB with PEEP and everything. You can actually do exactly uh, what you can do in intensive care with the ventilators. So pretty sophisticated ventilators. Then there is anesthesia and patient monitoring system. So uh, just not a multi-para monitor. So monitoring your heart rate, your blood pressure, ECG, IBP, anything you can actually monitor with them. But at the same time, also monitoring the anesthesia gases. You're delivering oxygen, your volatile anesthetic, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide. And then you can actually have integrated with the electronic medical records. Okay. So in some uh, centers, they will have that. Uh, we still actually don't use, uh, we are, this is, this is uh, one of my old uh, anesthesia machines and uh, you can actually see there is monitors, but uh, still a pen and paper there. So uh, still, we still have that. That does actually get scanned and put into electronic uh, uh, record keeping, but we don't actually use electronic record within the theaters. Maybe in the future we will when we go paperless. Uh, this is a little bit more modern machine. This is my hybrid theater where I work uh, for vascular. So you can actually see there are a lot more things. This is just before uh, we actually get the patient in. So in, in UK, we actually have anesthesia rooms. And in the anesthesia room, do most of the anesthesia part in the anesthesia room and then bring the patient into the theater. So why, why are we actually talking about workstations? Why are they essential for? So this is just in May uh, 2021, just this year, a uh, few months ago. Uh, the AGBI again came up uh, with recommendation for standard of monitoring during anesthesia and recovery. And it talks about, there's lots of things in it, but I'm just talking about the monitoring devices. They say in all cases, we should have pulse oximetry with uh, plethysmography. So we just know the numbers, but also the trace. Uh, we should be able to measure the uh, blood pressure automatically which, uh, using non-invasive blood pressure, ECG, of course. And uh, temperature monitoring is also a must and uh, should be monitored you know, continuously for long cases, but in case you can also mon uh, monitor every 30 minutes at, till the end of the surgery. And during uh, general anesthesia, you need to monitor the inspired and expired oxygen concentration. You need to monitor CO2 using capnography. 
And then again, depending on whether you're using a TIVA or you're using a uh, volatile anesthetic technique, uh, you need to monitor the inspired nitrous oxide, uh, inspired and, and antiral uh, inhaled anesthetic, uh, you know, the agents, the volatile anesthetic agents. Then uh, within the ventilators, there will also be airway pressure monitoring, tidal volume monitoring, respiratory rate. And some of them will also have the loop systems, which are very useful, uh, especially when you're doing low flow anesthesia. And if you're using TIVA, then you need to actually be using something like a e base monitor, which is a processed EEG monitoring. And if the patient diabetic also. So there are lots of things within the monitoring, and this is very, very important uh, part of it. And coming to, if you are actually using volatile anesthetic agents, then you need to actually monitor the antidotal anesthetic concentration. And most importantly, the MAC monitoring is important and it need to be, if you look at it, it says the, we need to maintain the antidotal anesthetic concentration of more than 0 0.7, that is MAC of more than 0 0.7. And it should be age adjusted, okay? That's very, very important. Actually, a lot of the old monitors don't actually have that. So it need to be age-adjusted uh, MAC. So that's important part of that. So uh, newer workstations have got all this, and that's why workstations, having a workstation is important. So you can actually have a simple machine, but if you actually have a monitoring system for all this, you can still use them because it allows you to actually know what has been delivered uh, at the end of the machine, what is coming out of the, you know, um, the machine end, so that's important. Uh, but with the new uh, workstations, everything is integrated, so it's easier that way. So uh, coming to low flow anesthesia, okay. So like I said, I was not going to go into details of the machine or what is there. You don't need to know because uh, you know the machines will likely have uh, electronic flow meters, and I can actually talk about, there's a whole session you can actually do on that, you can do on web prices. But like I said, it's a basic thing. You have the source and then it goes through, you know, it's pressure reduction valves are there and goes through the flow, flow meters, then to the web riser, then from web prices to come to the breathing circuit and the breathing circuit, different types. Obviously we'll be talking about more about the circle system. So the actual topic, today's topic is about low flow anesthesia. <clears throat> People get scared about it, okay. Um, but it's not as scary uh, because, that, that's because, you know, people start talking about minimal flow and metabolic flow, okay. <clears throat> we don't actually have to be that stringent. Um, uh, you don't actually have to go to metabolic flow or minimal flows. Even if you're able to actually maintain actual low flow anesthesia, which is around 0.5 to one liter. Uh, per minute, that is good enough. In our setup, uh, we tend to actually not allow the trainees, and that is the low flow society's uh, guidelines that uh, the trainee should not be using flows less than a liter. As a consultant, you can go up to metabolic flows, it's up to you. Uh, but you need to have, uh, you know, uh, you be very vigilant and your monitoring uh, has to be very stringent. So uh, low flows 0.5 to one liter, uh, medium flows one to two liters. Some people still use that, uh, but less and less people are using high and very high flows. So I think if anybody is using that, they're just wasting gases. Okay. So the main requirement for low flow anesthesia, and that's where the uh, workstation comes in that you need to actually have a circle rebreathing system. Uh, what it means is basically because it's got a soda line uh, which can absorb CO2, you can actually re return back the gases into the brain. So it's a rebreathing system. And you need uh, uh, flow meters, uh, which are accurate. So they are, you're able to actually adjust gas flows less than a liter. Uh, so uh, if you see the flow meters, where there are two flow meters for say oxygen has got two flow meters, you see that up to a liter. And then a liter is actually then divided into you know, 100 ml. So those kind of flow meters are important. Uh, our machines, newer machines actually have electronic flow meters. You just need to set the flows it, and the FIR2, it's automatically will actually, uh, you know, set the uh, flows for oxygen air or oxygen nitrous oxide. I will show you in a video uh, in a minute. It's all equally important that they, uh, you know, it's a tight uh, breathing system, there are uh, no leaks, or the test leak is less than 150 ml per minute at a pressure of 30, cent, uh, 30 centimeters of water. And then again, the testing is no longer done manually. Uh, it's all done automatically in the, in the machines. In the newer 
workstation, like I said, they are computerized. So all they need to do is, is actually let, let me alone and it'll go through one by one through everything. And wherever there is a problem, it will likely highlight that, okay? And obviously you need to have continuous gas monitoring, like okay? able to monitor oxygen, nitrous oxide, you know, your uh, volatile anesthetic agents and be able to also set in the age so you can have age adjusted MAC uh, monitoring with them. So this is actually uh, from Miller and uh, you can actually see the, uh, this is a circle system and uh, showing the inspiratory phase where the gases are actually coming from the fresh gas flows. And uh, there are actually gases uh, which would have collected in the reservoir bag that's been ventilated or it could be a ventilator and then flows to the patient. Okay. There are one-way valves, inspiratory and expiratory valves. Uh, there is in the inspiratory side, there is an oxygen cell, oxygen uh, fuel cell, which measures the oxygen concentration. Uh, it can be part of them within the machine as well. So some trigger machines are within, others will actually have, you can you have the fuel cell on the top of the, of the one-way valve. And the, and the expiratory phase, the uh, obviously the inspiratory valve closes on that side, the expiratory valve opens, gases flow through, and uh, the fresh gases are go through the uh, your uh, soda line, which is in the center, and then they collect in the back. So, uh, and the circle, uh, that's how it keeps going, this whole cycle keeps going, going on. And uh, there's obviously APL valve as well, um, where the excess gases are vented out. You can actually see on the very right end uh, from where they, it is also attached to the scavenger as well. So this is this is the uh, video I was talking about. Okay, you can actually see uh, these are these electronic flow meters uh, in them. Uh, I'll show a close up. So we're using here that is age is actually uh, registered. So it's the age adjusted mark of one. And uh, this is probably beginning of the case because we normally go down to almost point five to uh, point uh, sorry point seven to point eight mark. Uh, two way prices on there. We're using silver fluorine here. And then we're using a circle system. Um, this is a bag, bag is well filled. Uh, so these are appropriate amount of gases not collapsing. So if it is collapsing, then you know that you're not actually providing enough gases. Now the one also got an echnometer. So you can actually see that uh, it is actually on green. So it's efficient. And we're using 70% oxygen air. And uh, as I reduce the flows, you can actually see as it goes to 25, the FI to reduce to 200 mLs the FRD goes to 100. So that is when you actually are nearing or less than the metabolic rate. It cannot give you any mixture. It will have to deliver only oxygen because that's what it requires. The oxygen consumption uh, for uh, an adult is around 3 to 5 ml per kg body weight. Also on, on average around 250 ml is consumed. Uh, so you cannot actually go down below 250 ml for metabolic requirements. Uh, so that's the uh, machine. You can see the Mac monitors, uh, flows, electronic flow meters. You don't actually have to uh, adjust the uh, flow rates, uh, but again, I'll show you in other ones where you, you can do that. So obviously there are certain advantages and disadvantages of uh, you know, requiring that. And first is the direct cost. So if you actually want to um, you know, conduct cases under GA with low flows, and then you need to actually have a proper workstation, proper monitoring system. So that is the actual direct cost, it's there. And once that cost is taken into account, then you can actually start about how you're going to have your savings okay, over the period of time. So somebody who is actually uh, using flows of five liters per minute, almost 80% of the gases are going to get wasted. These are going to go into the environment, okay, there is, question about depletion of ozone. Uh, and if you're not using uh, the scavenging system, you would be breathing these gases in. You go home, you feel sleepy, you feel tired, okay? So those things are, you know, obviously, and that is because you're uh, you know, wasting gases, it's going to cost you a lot more. So if you actually say, look at the fresh gas flows, um, and even if you were using three liters and reduce it to one liter per minute, that is almost 50% uh, saving. So once you actually have the workstation and uh, then using uh, you know, low flows uh, makes sense. 
Uh, so we're not only saving the environment, we're not saving ourselves from inhaling those uh, gases, uh, but we're also saving, so we're reducing the cost of anesthesia uh, as such. Obviously, you can't compare this with regional anesthesia, pure regional anesthesia, nothing like it. Uh, no question, uh, that's the cheapest uh, method, but uh, assuming that patient requires a GA, uh, then it's possible to uh, cut the cost. Okay. And uh, this is actually a graph which is showing that uh, with the newer agents, I mean, uh, people still use isoflurane, some places still use uh, halothane, but if you look at the commonest gas used nowadays is zeofluorine, it's very pleasant. Uh, you know, you can uh, use it for the gas induction, okay, easy to handle. So if you look at uh, zeofluorine and desfluorine at high flows, uh, look at the cost difference is actually huge. So when you reduce the you know, flows from five liters to one liter, uh, the, you know, the cost goes down by almost 30%, uh, sorry, uh, more than 70%. Uh, so yes, cost savings with that. So how do we practically approach the low flow anesthesia? Okay, what are the components? Okay, like I said, people who talk about all kinds of, uh, you know, equations. Okay, you need to have this equation, that equation. Now you have to go back. Do I really need to know those equations? Those equations were actually used in the time when we didn't actually have sophisticated machines and people still wanted to uh, use low flow anesthesia. So they wanted to you know, be accurate in their calculations. You know, how much is going to the patient? How much is coming out? Uh, are we going to make them hypoxic if we continue with these flows? Okay. Those kind of questions, those were you know, important. But now the machines where we have machines where it is monitoring what's going in, what's coming out, you don't actually need all that kind of calculation. So it's all uh, just more theoretical, uh, important for confusing people uh, or uh, impressing people. You say, I know this equation, I can explain it. Uh, you don't need to actually have all that. So we'll go to a very practical approach of that. Okay. So the first phase is that uh, you are going to actually, uh, you know, do anesthesia as you would actually normally do in a theater. Okay. So uh, let me take you to what I do in my cases. Okay. So patient comes in, they have a checks in, uh, we connect them to monitor ECG blood pressure, uh, SPO2 get a drip in. Um, I don't actually uh, use uh, denitrogenation or pre-oxygenate as people uh, call it. If the patient's saturation is 98 to 97 to 98%, I just leave them sitting up a little bit, okay, breathing on, fill their lungs up with air, and induce them with profol. Okay, that's all you use. Uh, get the your my eye gel in, uh, leave them breathing spontaneously. Okay. So in the anesthesia room, when they start off, I'm going to actually leave them around six liters flow. So I'll leave them around six liter flow and with uh, the usual. Uh, in a concentration. So if I'm using civil frame, I'll leave them on two to 3%. Okay, we're still monitoring the concentration, what has been delivered to the patient. And once everything actually settles down, you need around 15 minutes or so. Okay, so this at this time, uh, we do rest of things. We do the blocks or the surgeon comes and they will likely do the checks or preparation of the patient. So you get enough time for equilibration to occur. Okay. So the, for the fresh gas flow, we will actually require initial high flows. Okay, and then we move on to the low flow. So once we have actually got a stability, okay, we have reached the uh, MAC uh, for that patient. And then you don't actually change the setting on the, on the vaporizer, okay. You do one thing at a time. So you reduce the flows, okay. Leave them for step, you know, just be equilibration, okay. And then after that, you can actually start reducing your uh, the dial setting on the uh, your vaporizer. Okay, so never do two things at a time. Just do one thing at a time. Okay, and I'll come to that again. I'll talk about why that is actually important. Okay, so we adjust the fresh gas flow in three stages. And last thing is the recovery. In the recovery phase, we tend to switch off the volatile anesthetic, increase the flows, and let the patient wash out. So it's just opposite of what do we do at the induction time. So. Induction, we are washing in the anesthetic gases. And at the time of the uh, your recovery, you're washing out. So letting the body at least, the patient is breathing, they will wash out the 
anesthetic gases. And once they reach the Mac awake, which is usually one third of the usual Mac, and they will start likely getting back their reflexes and waking up. So why initial high flows are actually required? So <clears throat> say for example, you are actually delivering 100% from the machine, but the lungs itself, okay, the, if you look at, uh, we have the uh, total lung capacity is around six liters. And of that uh, 500 uh, tidal volume, okay, the rest of this is your water capacity. Okay. Lots of it functional residual capacity of around 2.5 liters on, on average. So it, it varies from 2.2 .2 to 3.3 liters, depending on male or female and size of the patient. This is filled up with 21% oxygen and 78% nitrogen. So our aim is to actually, uh, you know, get 100% oxygen in, uh, fill, uh, you know, the functional residual capacity or the inspiratory capacity, which is there uh, with the oxygen and get rid of the 78% uh, of nitrogen. So that is what denitrogenation is. So how long does this going to take? Is there a scientific way of knowing that? And the answer is yes, okay. And there where the equations come in, but these are actually uh, simplified equations, okay. So just showing that how the, you know, the, especially the oxygen or nitrogen or volatile anesthetic, it have to actually, depending on what volatile anesthetic you're actually using, uh, how the, uh, you know, the concentration buildup or washing actually happens. Uh, so it's very quick for ones which are less fat solubles like desflurane, zeofluorine, but it's going to be slow for something like halothane or isoflurane, uh, which actually goes and get deposited in the fat. <laughs> so knowing knowing about, about how much time you require, we need to actually you know, get uh, to know about the time constants, okay? So there are two things, the rate constant and the time constants. A rate constant is basically your rate of flow, uh, and uh, flow is just volume over time, which is a liter per minute over volume. And the time constant is just opposite of the rate constant. So uh, the tau or the time constant is volume over rate of flow. So if you can look at the rate constant, uh, the unit is going to be one by minute, whereas the time constant is going to be minute. Okay, it's opposite of the rate constant. Okay. So how are they different? So I'll give you an example. Okay, so say for example, you have a bathtub and you want to fill it and you know the flow rate, say the flow in the, uh, you know, this is a uh, say like 100 liter of uh, the tub volume. You want to fill it up to 100 liters and the flow is one liter per minute. So you know from that you can calculate how long it is going to take for the tub to fill up. Simple, that's the rate constant. But say that, your child has actually uh, come uh, from playing uh, football. It was raining, uh, full of mud, it gets into the bath and there's mud in the bath, okay. And <clears throat> now you want to clear this mud, right? So if you actually fill the tub with just water, it will actually get muddy. So you want to actually clear this mud. How long is it going to take for this mud to clear off? Okay, at the rate, same rate. So assuming that the uh, you know, the drainage is actually the same as, as what is water, water coming in. So if 100 ml is coming in, 100 ml gets out, say for the example that way. Okay, so then the rate is uh, say 100 ml per minute and the wash is also 100 ml per minute. In that case, how long is this going to take? That is what is about time constant date. So you can look at it, for example, that in the lungs, uh, we have nitrogen. Okay, say for example, that is the mud. Okay, and oxygen is the, the clear water. So how long will it take for us to get rid of this nitrogen? That is uh, the time constant we're talking about. Okay. So like that, like I said, time constant is volume or rate of uh, flow uh, or okay, volume or rate of flow and rate of flow is volume over time. So if you cancel out the volumes, all you left is one by one by time. That is equal to time because time moves up. Okay, so the unit for time constant is going to be minutes. Okay. So for simplification, uh, let's say our minute ventilation is four liters per minute. I assume there are PG students, so just said minute ventilation is nothing but tidal volume into the respiratory rate. And like uh, the functional reserve capacity can vary between 2.5 to 3.3 liters, uh, but 
for ease of calculation, let's say the function residual capacity is two liters. So in this case, the time constant is going to be two liters or four. So that's going to go into 0.5 minutes again. So how is this important? Okay, so if you look at the time constants, so one time constant, you have completed around 63% of the process. By four time constant, it is around 98%. Okay. So you need around five to six time constant to complete a process. So like we were talking about the mud in the, in the bathtub, okay, you would, so if you actually calculate the time constant for the clearance of mud, then you would need whatever time constant you get, you multiply by say approximately six. Okay, but if you actually allow that time, then you will actually have clear water in that. So that's what time constant is. Okay, so that's, uh, you need to know that by four time constant, 98% of the process is complete. So in for the lungs, that's the rate constant. So how much oxygen is going constantly, that may be rate constant. When you're talking about time constant, then we're looking at how the oxygen is replacing the nitrogen when you get 100% oxygen. Okay, that's uh, like knowing the time constant. Okay. So washout of nitrogen uh, and uh, or washing of uh, you know 100% oxygen, it will take say 0.5 into six, that is three minutes, okay. This we are assuming that the circuit is already primed with 100% oxygen, and I'll come to what uh, that priming means. So on the right side, you can actually uh, see a graph that by the four time constants, the oxygen is almost like, you know, replace 98% of the nitrogen uh, in the functional residual capacity has been replaced uh, with the oxygen. So you got good reserve of oxygen and that's good enough actually in most of the times. So what is not nitrogen is oxygen. That's what I meant. So when you're actually replacing that, so washing of the nitrogen is equal to washing of oxygen. Okay, you are just replacing nitrogen with uh, oxygen. And that's why the process is not called pre-oxygenation. It is called denitrogenation. So that's very important concept to tell. Okay. So we also know that, say for example, is a first case of the day. Okay, the machine has been shut off uh, during the week. Uh, you know, the first uh, case of the day, it's not been primed. And how long will it take for us to fill the whole system uh, with 100% oxygen? Okay, that's what is priming is. Some machine will actually have a, a basal flow of 200 mLs, even if you actually, you know, get the flow meters down to zero, they will keep giving you uh, 200 mLs of oxygen constantly. Okay. So circuit volume, you know, including the, uh, you know, the circuit system, the uh, CO2 absorber can be approximately almost six liters. So it's almost equal to what your uh, water capacity is. Okay, so uh, six liters is the circuit volume. Uh, so if we now actually uh, have the flow, we set the flow of oxygen to six liter per minute and the time constant is one. And as like I said, so it takes six time constants to complete the whole uh, denitrogenation also, or so filling up or washing out. Because what is going to be left in the circuit once the machine is switched off is just air, okay, which is oxygen and nitrogen. So it takes around six minutes. But say, for example, you use a flush. Now the flush on the oxygen actually deliver anywhere from 50 liters to uh, 70 liters per minute. And let's say for ease of thing that is delivering 30 liters per minute. So if you actually use a flush, and uh, the time constant comes down to 0 0.2. So six liters or 30 liters per minute, and that's 0 0.2 minutes. And six time time constant is, okay, that is uh, six into 0.2, 1.2 minutes. So if you actually keep the flush on for 1.2 minutes, so almost a minute or so, you can actually uh, you know, wash out everything and you can prime the whole circuit. So it depends on what flows you're using or when you start using the flow. So that's important concept in uh, you know, low flow anesthesia. Okay. Now, like I said, some machines have basal flow of 200 mLs of oxygen going all the time. In those cases, if you look at it, so you have six liters or 0.2 liters per minute, that's 30 minutes and 30 into six, six or 80, 180 minutes. So you need three hours. So once you switch on the machine, so when you come back, and if you leave the machine for three hours at 200 mLs, 
it will take us three hours to prime the whole system uh, with uh, oxygen. Right? So that's a long time. So we would like to leave it for, give a flush, uh, 30 liters flush uh, for one minute and it is all primed up. Okay. So what about the volatile anesthetics? Okay. The volatile anesthetics are actually carried by your carrier gases. So oxygen air or oxygen nitrous oxide, these are all carrier gases. Okay. Volatile anesthetic travels along with it. It's a carrier, it's like the child on the dad's slab. Okay. And hence it's important because they're carried, the rate of change of the volatile anesthetic will likely depend on the rate of change of the, uh, you know, the carrier. So if you walk slowly, the distance travel is the same as the, what the dad and mom are actually going at the speed. Okay, so if they travel fast, you know, they will likely uh, reach quicker. Okay, same thing actually holds with volatile anesthetics as well. So when you have low flows and yeah, say your, uh, you know, mag drops to say 0.5, now, if you just increase the concentration uh, from say 2% lead, 2 on the civil frame to 7%, it's going to take a long time because the carriers are actually going at the same rate. Or the best way is, okay, leave it at two or 3% uh, percent and increase the flow. Okay, it's increase the speed of mother and father. Okay, and then you reach quicker. Okay. So that's, that's very, very important. And that's why it's important to actually set your alarms on the machines. Okay, so you don't want a Mac that are going up, okay, patient, you don't want patient waking up, and that's one of the flows, okay. So low flow anesthesia, nothing but utilizing the waste, okay, we are actually helping the future generation, we are helping to save the earth, and that's why low flow anesthesia is actually important. So how do we do it? So I have actually already, you know, talked about one of the concepts, main concepts uh, in the low flow anesthesia. Now I'll take you uh, through the rest of it as well. So uh, this is a nice uh, diagram uh, where we're showing that uh, we are using oxygen nitrous oxide, uh, we're using civil fluorine, and uh, we're just giving 1.25% of civil fluorine with 50-50 almost of oxygen nitrous oxide. So what we take into the body, okay, what is used up by the body, is very small amount because if you look at what has been exhaled, so out of the 1.25%, 1% has been exhaled out of the CO fluorine, which will go into the atmosphere. Okay, almost 42% of the oxygen is also wasted. Okay, not a big thing, but what about nitrous oxide? 45% of nitrous oxide. So the idea of, of the low flow anesthesia is to actually, uh, you know, use that and return it back to the inhalation okay, so that we can reduce the amount of the fresh gas flows. So we just need to recycle it. So it's all about recycling the gases, uh, you know, in a clever way. Okay. So it's as simple as that. Okay, so we're recycling it. And for doing this recycling, uh, we need to actually uh, have monitoring is the most important aspect of it. So now we know uh, we need to recycle, but uh, what do we need for that? Obviously this stuff, isn't it? That's what I was actually telling you about. We need to actually have a workstation. That's where it comes from. The monitoring the gases, being able to actually use a, a adjusted Mac, able to know how much is going in and how much is coming out. Okay, that is very, very important. Okay. So requirement low flow anesthesia, this is again the reputation of the previous slides uh, I've shown before. So we need a circle rebreathing system with soda lines, obviously. We need to actually have flow meters, uh, which can be adjusted to flow, uh, fresh gas flows of uh, less than one liter per minute, no leaks within the system and continuous gas monitoring. This is very, very important. Okay. So <clears throat> let's uh, start off again, uh, how we actually conduct it. Okay, so initial 15 minutes, five to 15 minutes, you need to actually have initial high flows. And I've already explained to you why you need to actually have high flows at the beginning of the case. Especially if it is the first case of the day, do not forget about priming the circuit, okay? Use your flush or use uh, high flows 
Okay, remember the time constant required okay, uh, for the circuit. So that's going to be constant from most breathing systems. So you can't go wrong in that. Then about the patient, uh, we might require to, obviously it's not only denitrogenation of the patient, it's also denitrogen. What we did by high flows, initial high flows, you denitrogenated the whole breathing system. Okay, there was nitrogen, nitrogen, plenty of nitrogen in the air. Then we need to actually rapidly wash in the desired uh, oxygen concentration. So we need to build up the oxygen air or oxygen nitrous oxide and uh, your volatile anesthetic concentration to be able to actually get to up to a mac of almost one. So we start off with one and then we actually start reducing it. You don't have to go above one. Okay. But we also need to actually avoid the gas volume deficiency. And this is this is uh, very important to understand what is gas volume deficiency. It, okay. Then once you, so you kept the patient on high flows, you managed to actually get the MAC up. Okay, patient is actually nice and well settled. Uh, so when do you go on to the low flows? Obviously you can actually decide after five to 15 minutes, uh, you, you reach equilibration. Okay. Uh, at low flows, you have to remember that the, what you set on the vaporizer concentration will not match what has been delivered to the patient. Okay. There's always be a uh, discrepancy in that. It's always low. So when you're having low flows, even say for one MAC, you might actually need to deliver higher concentration, keep the dial at around uh, 2 to 3% initially. Okay. Later on, uh, you can reduce reduce that. Okay. So the time uh, uh, you know, required to reach the desired concentration uh, can be prolonged uh, because of the low flows. Okay. And it's very important to monitor the oxygen concentration because you can actually have hypoxic mixture being delivered if you're not careful. And the entitled anesthetic concentration or eat tag is actually essential uh, to know because the last thing you want is have these uh, MAC dropping down or patient waking up. So that's equally important. So this is a graph for looking at the various agents and we can actually see that you know, uh, agents like isoflurane or sevoflurane, uh, they also actually go into the fat. Okay, so they are fat soluble, higher fat so, uh, solubility. Uh, whereas desflurane, nitrous oxide, they are not fat soluble. So they, they equilibrate very, very quickly. So uh, this is actually important to know uh, how or how quickly uh, you would reach the uh, alveolar to the inspired concentration. Okay. So you need to reach the concentrated ratio to one as quickly as possible. And uh, this can actually take uh, time uh, if you're using older anesthetic agents. Okay. So uh, coming to what is gas volume deficiency. So if you actually reduce the flow, so you got a patient uh, uh, induced anesthesia, you got a patient onto the oxygen air or nitrous oxide as volatile anesthetic agent. And you say, oh, God, the Mac, and I'm going to drop it quickly, okay, that's when things can actually go wrong. So when the volume of the uh, fresh gas falls uh, below the total gas uptake, now you have to see that the uptake in the initial phase will actually, like I said, depend on what volatile anesthetic you're, uh, you know, you're using. So if you're using isoflurane or sevoflurane, you need a little bit more time compared to desflurane. And if that gap occurs, that is when we say there is a gas volume deficiency, and when this happens, then you can, can, it can trigger disconnection alarm. You say, why is the machine giving alarm? You know, I'm fine, everything is connected fine. Or if you actually have rising bellows, okay, the bellows will not reach the top. Okay. So uh, these are two of the things that can be noticed with that. So this is the alarm system is actually set at 10 bar. And uh, you're on the left side, you can actually see the peak and plateau on the graph. And slowly this peak and plateau will actually go below the graph. And that's when the, the machine will think it has got disconnected, it is losing volume or something has happened wrong and then start alarming. So uh, gas volume deficiency call, can cause uh, disconnection alarm. And then if you look at the graph, the oxygen concentration can also fall, okay, because the too rapidly have reduced, there are different causes uh, for this. But in most cases, it will never be exactly at the same what he actually set. So even if you set 50%, you will see that it will actually uh, come uh, come down uh, you know, uh, over the period of time. 
And there's very important cause for this, okay? So uh, one of the thing which is important is that there is denitrogenation happening. So this happens, uh, especially if you are using higher concentration of oxygen. And we tend to produce nitrogen, constantly produce nitrogen. And if you're using low flow anesthesia, and uh, the uh, soda lime, it cannot absorb it. It just actually get accumulated in the soda lime and it'll constantly dilute it. So the only way to do is it to actually keep the FIO2 only still on the higher side, or in between you actually give a flush and wash out the nitrogen uh, within or increase the flows. So you have to have a close eye and make sure that your alarms are set. I have seen the FIO2 going down to almost 18% when people were not actually, you know, uh, knowing what was going on. They said, oh, we said the uh, FIO2 to 50%. So why is it actually 18%? That's because the nitrogen is accumulating throughout the system. Same thing happened with nitrous oxide. After some time, the amount of nitri nitrous oxide equilibrates in the system. So whatever extra you're getting is just going into the circle and diluting the oxygen. So same thing, even if you whether you use oxygen air or use oxygen nitrous oxide, it is, it is going to dilute it. So after some time, you can actually switch off the nitrous oxide completely. It'll keep circulating in the system. So this is this is just a very short video. Okay, you can actually see that. And I've set it to 70 and uh, 70, okay. So that is my rule. So if you look at it, the, the oxygen is at uh, 450 ml, air is 250 mLs. And I've seen that. So this is, I call it my rule of uh, 0.7. So the FIO2 of 0.7 and flow of 0.7 liters total. I've seen that if you actually use this combination, then you can forget, you know, that you will actually have hypoxic mixture at any time. This is for air. This is for air. So when you're using oxygen air, you keep it at that, leave it, forget it. Okay, you will never actually get to a hypoxic concentration. But if you do this uh, with 30 to 50%, uh, you're invariably, you can actually get to a hypoxic concentration uh, within two hours. You will actually see uh, there is accumulation of uh, nitrous oxide diluting the oxygen uh, to levels, to hypoxic levels. Okay. So coming to the recovery phase, recovery phase, like I said, uh, once everything is done, it depends on the duration of surgery, obviously. It's absolutely opposite of uh, what we did at induction. That's what we're going to do, isn't it? Uh, if you are given neuromuscular blockade, you will going to reverse it. Okay. And once the patient starts breathing off, you're going to switch off the volatile anesthetic. You increase the flows of oxygen. Okay. Most people give 100%. I don't believe in that. I, we tend to actually keep it to 70%. I'll keep the 70%. Nitrogen is important for the lungs. It's got a splinting effect. Okay. And... Uh, Depending on uh, what agent you have used, uh, if you use desferrin, seoferrin, a uh, patient will, you know, open up their eyes uh, very quickly within five to ten minutes. They will once the they are down to Mac awake, which is one third of the uh, Mac, and they they start waking up. Okay, so uh, nothing. There's no uh, you know rocket science in in this. There, like I said, there are potential risks uh, with low flow anesthesia. I explained how accidental hypoxia can happen. Hypercapnia can happen as well uh, in these patients, especially if you are you know, uh, not taking care. You need to make sure that soda lime is fresh. Any amount of exhaustion there, uh, CO2 can start. So you need to have functioning uh, soda lime at all times. And uh, because the water anesthetic concentration varies uh, with low flows, and uh, if you don't keep an eye on it, again, a uh, patient who are paralyzed, um, inadequate depth of anesthesia and awareness can happen. Now, because we're using soda lime uh, with uh, the low flows, and uh, they are people who say, well, you get all compound A, compound B, compound. those sort of things are not, they never reach the level. So you, if you're looking at uh, the compound A uh, with seoferrin, you need to actually reach uh, more than 50 parts per million uh, to cause any kidney demand. And in clinical setting, that's never been seen. So uh, this is very rare, but it can happen. But you can have accumulation of carbon dioxide. That is a very interesting uh, bit, uh, with, uh, especially with uh, desferrin. It accumulates uh, quite a lot in that, and it can actually start messing around with your monitoring Okay, your CO2 will start rising because it is detected as CO2 by the analyzers. Okay, so 
toxic metabolites. Less of a uh, concern, but it can happen. When you take blood gas in the long cases, you will actually see carbon monoxide levels rising. So just to summarize, uh, thing, if you need to actually practice low flow anesthesia, uh, you need a workstation. Uh, you need to understand uh, the concept of time constants. Okay, like I said, it's not anything rocket science. You can calculate it very easily. If you know what flows, you know the volumes, so you can actually get the time constants. And for any process, it's try five to six time constant, the process is almost complete. And you require constant vigilance. I mean, we are actually used to that as anesthetists. That is our motto to be vigilant at all times. Uh, but setting up alarm limits, okay, at the beginning of the case helps in that. So even if you're distracted or you are busy doing something else like putting records in, yeah, alarms when it alarms you know that what's wrong. So that's important. And uh, if you are practicing anesthesia and you do a lot of cases with general anesthesia, it's necessary to save the environment and save money. And that's what uh, low flow anesthesia does. And so once you actually have invested in a good uh, workstation, then you are going to save time. And low flow anesthesia, like I said, it's about recycling the useful waste. Okay, what we breathe out uh, can be actually used. Okay. Um, one thing I didn't touch upon uh, is uh, low flow anesthesia uh, with endotracheal uh, with so, breathing. If somebody has got their mic on, please can we act without them to switch off? Please? Thank you. So, um, yes, you can use. Uh, Low flow anesthesia, I have been using it for years and years with actually, it is the easiest way to do. So if you really want to learn low flow anesthesia, uh, start it off with, uh, you know, spontaneous ventilation. So if you have a good tight fitting mask, um, there's not much leak around it. And you don't use uh, neuromuscular blockades with subnagotic devices. In most cases, you can actually use low flow anesthesia, easy to just, uh, you know, you just keep observing the back, the back shouldn't collapse. Uh, you can put a, you know, APL valve to five to 10 centimeters of water. So there's less leaks around it. So it's very easy to actually do it with, uh, even with uh, spontaneous ventilation. And, uh, and even if your patients, um, you know, the ETAC, that is the entire anesthetic concentration drops to a little less, they will start moving. They won't, you know, they will give you that be the first indication that you are actually, uh, no need to actually increase your flow. So it can be done with uh, both endotracheal tube as well as uh, with spontaneously uh, breathing patients. Okay. And uh, thank you uh, for listening and thank you for inviting me. I'll stop sharing screen and uh, ready for questions and interaction. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I'd like to ask. Yes, Preeti. Sir, we have few questions. Mayuresh, you yep. can go. Yeah, go yes, ahead. Sir. Yeah. Uh, there are some of uh, some of the questions like uh, if there is disconnection in between, someone asked, uh, yeah. and bellows fall down, uh, yeah. then we have to again start up with the high flows and uh, then absolutely. yeah, okay, okay, absolutely, absolutely. Any time there is disconnection or the because the moment you are uh, you get disconnected, right. you likely lose a lot of right. uh, you know yeah. you will likely so go back always go back to it's always like go okay. back to the beginning okay yeah, start from yeah. there and then start so right, and right. i will assume that there will be concentration uh, these you will see with low flows when there is a disconnection the mac actually drops very very quickly okay so uh, that's one thing other thing i would always say is when you're using low flows always keep a syringe of profile with you okay fine yeah yeah i would always give a small dose if it's ha that's happening or your uh, Mac has early, actually dropped. Early age. Uh, just give, yeah, just give a bit of uh, profile and then take over from there. Okay. 
Yeah. Even in even in spontaneously breathing patient, I would actually say that always keep a propulse range with you. Yes, yes, right, sir. Uh, the same. Uh, the question related to the same. If there is a the in between the case, we have to reach uh, the uh, depth of anesthesia earlier, rapidly. Uh, yeah. In that case, we can use IV anesthetics, uh, like uh, yes, changing the concentration the induction of low same. flow. Induction. Yeah. Induction is with propofol, so you yeah. actually that's what you do. You, yeah. Obviously, you can do gas induction. Yeah. There are the times when patients, uh, you mm -hmm. know, they say that uh, you know they can't have IV, so you actually start off. Patients don't like IV, and then you start yeah. gas induction, yeah. get IV lines, and then do it. It happens. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. induction is always intravenous. Like I say, induction is not yeah. necessary. Yeah. Okay, no, like no, with the same it's between. Not a, in between the case, if uh, you can. Uh, yeah, we can use the uh, uh, IV anesthetics. Too. You because can also really the rapid. Uh, okay, but yeah, that will uh, so, that will take care uh, early if we just increase the flows, or it will I've, take time. Exactly, I've given you the answer at the beginning itself. If yeah. your mac IV is anesthetic. dropping, okay, yeah. you need to increase the flow. Yeah. Okay. And it's like I that. said. Remember the child. Okay, being carried on the father. Okay. Right. 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 Yeah. So uh, it is. Where are you going to reach? Okay, so it depends on how fast the father is going. Correct, right? correct, correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's so carrier, said, it's the carrier gas. Uh, the volatile anesthetic is carried by the carrier gases. Okay. Yes, sir, yes. If you want to need to increase the concentration, you need to increase the uh, flow of the carrier gases. Yes. So you said that uh, low flow anesthesia affects CO2 absorption absorber uh, because the nitrous also uh, nitrogen also depletes the absorber. So there is more concentration of uh, absorb uh, more uh, more absorber needed in low flow cases or something like that. No, no, no. It's that's that's not that is to do with nitrogen accumulation. Yeah. So we actually have nitrogen. So if, especially if you're using air, there is nitrogen in that body is producing nitrogen. Right, right, and that. Uh, the soda lime doesn't absorb it, so it will get collected in, in the breathing system that will dilute the oxygen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. but it will. Otherwise, the rate the rate of absorption is is the same whether you're using high flows. Rather, it will be the high flows which will uh, cause that. So, rate of uh, CO two, uh, it's basically reacting with CO two. It's not reacting. You're pr producing CO two at the same rate. Right, right. Whether you are actually using low flow, high flow, it does not matter. It's your CO two production. Yes. Yes. Right. CO2 production is almost constant unless you go hypothermic or you develop a malignant hypothermia when you produce more carbon dioxide, then it'll get exhausted. So irrespective of that, okay, CO2, uh, the soda lime uh, will likely up, just absorb the, uh, your uh, carbon dioxide. That's what it is meant for. Okay, Maybe a bit of volatile, but most of the volatiles get recirculated as well. So are there any changes seen in the uh, capnograph uh, mm -hmm. in low flow compared to the uh, like uh, someone said that there are low lower concentration of ETCO2 are seen during nope. the low flow? No, that's absolutely wrong. That's absolutely that's wrong. Contrary. Okay, the CO2 actually should not. Rather, <laughs> you will actually see, uh, especially mm -hmm. in in uh, spontaneous as a breathing patient, you will see a CO2 rising. rising. But that is a that's the thing. But low flows should not affect your capnography. Capnography yeah. depends. On again, it's to do with your CO2 production. Right. Okay, if you're actually having uh, low CO2, either there's a leak somewhere, your CO2 is leaking out somewhere, yeah. or you have got hypotension where then your CO2 actually will, will be affected okay. by it. Okay. So it's simple, it's, 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 uh, it's your ventilation perfusion ma matching, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So if your perfusion goes down, your CO2, even your production is the same, okay. that will go down as well. Or there is actually leakage at the, at the point where, it, because you actually have system, there are almost 200 mLs are withdrawn. Again, I did not touch upon that again. So you've got machines which do not return back the, the gases which are taken in for analysis. Okay. Right. So in those cases, 200 mLs is being lost constantly. Okay. So you can't actually then actually have patients on 200 mLs. You can't, or 250 mLs for metabolic rate. So you need to add that. So that means it's better off just being around, uh, you know, 450 to 500 mLs of the, so if you want to be also be minimal uh, flows. So you need to actually know from your workstation whether the gases which are actually withdrawn by 150, 200 mL per minute, are they added back or they are actually vented out. That is the equally important to know.
Yes, sir. Uh, Sanjot, madam, I asked uh, uh, whether low flow anesthesia can be used in extremes of age, like uh, neonate, child. Uh, I do not actually like have patient. experience uh, with the pediatrics that did uh, pediatric long back, but yes, uh, there are actually, uh, you know, pediatric circle systems are available, so you can actually use them. And yes, elderly, I use it. I've used in uh, in 100 years old. We use it all the time. I do a lot of elderly patients, so we use uh, low flow anesthesia in them all the time. Okay. Uh, low flow is for everyone. Circle system is for everyone. Circle system is a universal breathing circuit or breathing system. It can be used for pediatrics. Like uh, there are at least smaller tubing with less amount of gas, so it can be used for that as well. But saying that, uh, I don't technically do pediatrics. I mostly do adults. So uh, we can always actually ask our pediatric uh, in the pediatric symposium about that. They can talk about the low flows. But I think I'm sure they, they do use it. So in obese patient, any problem happens with any uh, low flow? So specific? in obese patients, again, uh, you have to be because there are a lot of fat. And then uh, if you're using uh, agents like isoflurane mm -hmm. or even sevoflurane, uh, for short surgeries, it does not matter for short surgeries, but, but long surgeries, your wake up will be slow. Okay. <laughs> so you need to either switch off the anesthetic gases early, the world anesthetic early. And IVM. Or, or you use something like desflurane for them. Mm -hmm. But I tend to actually use, uh, even in morbidly obese, I tend to actually use sevoflurane. It's mm -hmm. just that I switch off early. As mm -hmm. soon as they actually, the surgeon, it you have to watch the surgeon and see. As soon as the surgeon starts, uh, you know, closing, you actually uh, stop the sevoflurane. And in the end, you just wait for it to wash out. It'll wash out. If the patient is breathing, they'll wash it out. Uh, so, ma'am, also I have asked, uh, were there any specific uh, uh, mention regarding the anesthetic agent of choice, which is safer? You can use it with sevoflurane, isoflurane. Uh, you can use it with uh, desflurane. Right. Um, Halothen, it wasn't, I don't think I have any experience with it. I think it wasn't used with uh, halothen, but I think with the newer, all newer agents, I think isoflurane, sevoflurane, desflurane, uh, you can use with any of them. Rather, I think for desflurane because uh, it depletes the ozone, it's uh, actually recommended that you use the minimal flow, even to metabolic rate. And it used to be costly and still probably is costlier than sevoflurane. Right. So right. conserving that made sense uh, using a desflurane. Rather saying that it was when desflurane was introduced that the circle system actually came into vogue. You know, people yeah, start, yeah. oh, it is costly. Let's, you know, we need to conserve this. And people started, because uh, sevoflurane people were still afraid. They used to think that if you use uh, with soda lime, it is going to compound A, compound B, compound C, you know, all those kind of things. Uh, kidney injury, you know, it got seven fluoride atoms. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the fluoride, fluoride, uh, I, the concentration need to be more than 50 parts per million with uh, the, uh, you know, with sevoflurane. And that yeah, never reaches yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And interestingly, people have seen that uh, the amount of kind of uh, kidney injuries which happen, it can happen with other agents as well. Yes. It's probably related to more to hypotension, intra-op hypotension, uh, okay. rather than the agent being used. Mm -hmm. uh, so Smita Shamanam have asked uh, whether we can use low, low flow anesthesia with supraglottic airway devices. Uh, I've already answered yeah. that at the end yeah. of my lecture. Yeah. So I use it all the time. I mean, I do almost 80 to 90 percent of my cases uh, with supraglottic devices, and I use low flow anesthesia for all of them. But like I said, I don't go to minimal flows. Okay. okay. Like my rule is of 70. Okay. I use oxygen air, so uh, 0. 0.7 and 0. 0.7. So I have to 0. 0.7 and flows of 700 mLs, and so that is probably between the your minimal and low flow anesthesia, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that's because over the period of time, I realized that when I when I am in trainees and they you know uh, they want to use that kind of flows, if they reduce the FiO2 to around fifty percent, uh, it can the dilution of because of nitrogen actually goes down rapidly. Mm -hmm. So, if the more the air you introduce along with the oxygen, because air has got nitrogen, isn't it? You you are providing more yes. nitrogen, and From that is accu accumulating within the system. Yes. So if you keep the night, the uh, you know the nitrogen levels, that is the air, to around you know twenty to thirty percent, mm -hmm. then you're you're safe. Yeah. The lowest it goes is around probably forty percent, 
and that you know these are semi closed system you know that once the excess gases build up they do vent out and okay little bit of will go into the uh, uh, you know the scavenging system yes yes uh, but that's that's uh, i think uh, um, Sir, we do not have air uh, facility for air here, okay. and plus we do not have BIS monitoring and uh, AGM. In all, yeah. so okay. how do we go about with the flow? Like I said, unsafe. Okay. Yeah. So can purely oxygen be? Do not actually. Um, um, well, saying that in, spon in spontaneous breathing patient. Okay. Kindly mute, please. Just yeah. Yes, sir. So, if you are actually doing with, uh, you know, with spontaneous breathing pa patients without neuromuscular blockage, you can probably still try that, okay. because then your patient becomes your monitor. Mm -hmm. If the vote, so you are worried about two two things you are worried about here, right? One is the oxygen, right? So I've given you the trick for that. So trick for that is that you use the higher concentration of oxygen and keep that. The other thing is to actually then you have to have a close eye on uh, the patient monitoring. Why are, why did they have unmuted themselves? Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So can we yeah. uh, start with only no, but oxygen? With the, if you're using, sorry, uh, if you are actually going to paralyze the patient and trickle tube, then I think uh, it's not very safe okay. to actually do it without actually having monitoring. And that's where, that's why the first part of the lecture is about, uh, you know, uh, workstations. With, and workstation means monitoring. Just having a machine which is, looks modern is not a workstation. Okay. okay, that people need to be clear. It comes with all those aspects that it has got monitoring for gases, it's got monitoring of the airways, okay, it's got proper monitoring or multi panel monitor. Okay, if somebody is telling you I'm selling you a, a workstation, then they just are not giving this, then they're just selling you an anesthesia machine. Yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, so, so uh, what all should we look for when we are uh, uh, going to buy a machine then? So like I said, they, the machine is the basic anesthesia machine you all know, okay. It's just that everything is there. So you need to make sure that it has got entitled monitoring for your oxygen. So in spready, expiratory oxygen, your CO2 capnography is there. Your entitled uh, agent monitoring, ETAC monitoring is there, okay. And that it allows you to have age edges. So when you actually input age, it will actually automatically change the age of that. Okay. And then comes your multi-para monitor. So this should actually come as part of the workstation. When anybody is selling the workstation, they say, no, the workstation actually means that there is monitoring. Now, about the easy, easy monitoring and things, those are... So there this was one more, uh, one easy more. Monitoring, those are just additional things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can, can I ask one question? question? Can I ask a question? Yes, 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 yes please. I'm Dr. Gore from Pune. Thanks very much for presentation. I just want to know what is the importance of monitoring end tidal agent concentration, whether it keeps us safe as far as awareness of the patient is concerned during low flow anesthesia, whether we have to have a good monitoring of end tidal agent concentration, which we have not discussed in our, uh, just now uh, our discussion. I have actually mentioned that. Yes, yes, we have a mention, we have a mention, yeah. but can yeah. we have quantitative? Uh, yes, I have mentioned in the, if you actually see that, the first thing I mentioned why this is important. CO flow I show the, so, I show the AG guide guidelines. Yes, patient is paralyzed. Yes, Hello? so it need to be more than zero point max. And uh, max should be age adjusted, right? Yes, and it should be more yes. than zero point seven. Yes, yes. But in I terms, mention... in terms of not in terms of MAC, but in terms of agent con direct agent concentration. No, no, like it is MAC. No, no, no. Listen, it should be no, MAC. Only. Be MAC. Yeah, it should be MAC, MAC and not absolutely. one point five or two. No, entitled concentration. No, no. no. Okay, 
Thanks, Rich. If you actually, if you're on the group and if you go to my last post, this is from 2014. Right. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not on the group. I'm an yeah. institution consultant. Okay. Yeah. Thank anybody you. anybody Thank can you. be. We have we have professor level people from all over the world yeah, on the yeah. group, so anybody can actually be on the group. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thanks and, very much. Thank yeah. you very much. So there is actually graphs. Uh, it was actually published in BJA probably in uh, I think it's 2008 or something like that. So they have actually given graphs. Yes. Yes. So way which you can use. So I have posted those graphs on the group uh, where. You can, it is a very tedious process. See, it's not easy to actually know what the Mac is be going to be for what age and what flows and those are. So I think that's what it makes. That's why I was saying those, all those calculations become irrelevant. All those uh, complex become irrelevant when you have good monitors. Right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, can I ask one question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sir, see, of the four requirements we have, soda lime, ETCO2, and uh, dragger machines, Fabius Plus. But we don't have gas analyzers. So up to what liters we can practice safely from? At least four liters, can we come up to two liters? No, I didn't get that, sorry. Uh, what, do you, what do you have, what do you don't have? Uh, we In don't have uh, gas analyzers. Gas analyzers. Yeah. yeah. And other things we have, suppose uh, soda lime, uh, ETCO2, and a uh, good machine workstation like Dragger Fabius Plus. Yeah. So we can't uh, apply um, uh, low flow anesthesia, but then up to uh, two liters, can we use? Yes, yes, you can. You can. I think, like you said, you. That's the that's the thing with with uh, anesthesia. I mean, the monitoring makes you safer, allows you to actually do that. And I think uh, everybody, I think it's it's now a, a national recommendation. I mean, the problem with Indian setup has been they don't. I mean, even with uh, CO2 monitoring, they were so reluctant to actually bring it into the minimum standard monitoring. Now, these have actually moved on. Now, this is 2021 guidelines coming from AGBI. And uh, I think we need to move on. These are not costly monitors. Okay, these are not costly monitors at all. Uh, uh, these are they now the newer machine actually combine them. So they are actually part of it. So if you do not actually have uh, the uh, monitoring for that, so all you can do is that try to actually maintain uh, the Mac. So you can actually, like I said, look at the graph and keep the patient into around 0.8 to 1 Mac throughout the, and then you're safe. So you Namaste. can actually probably go up to 1 liter. Yeah. Namaste, sir. I am Dr. Lee speaking from Sangli. I have a small question. When you shift to low flow anesthesia, yeah. then do you need to increase the concentration? No, like I said, you don't do anesthetic gases. You don't do the same two two things at a time, right? So when you are actually reducing the flow, you keep the concentration dial constant. Okay. Well, until the end, after some time, you have to increase or decrease. Yes, but that is only possible if you actually have the uh, monitoring, isn't it? If you actually have gas monitoring, then you can do yeah. it. Yeah. So yes, it, yeah, it requires yeah. actually. And one of the greatest advantage of nitrous oxide is that your requirement for sewer fluorine goes down to almost like 0.2 percent. Yeah. yeah, yeah nitrous yeah. oxide is fantastic to use with uh, low flow anesthesia and uh, uh, with volatiles. Your requirement, I think. You would be using minuscule amount of sevoflurane uh, if you're using oxynitrous oxide. So air is all. Yes, I think what the concentration? Is all so, so, <laughs> so <laughs> having a yes. we keep talking about oxygen air, but I think if there is no contraindication to using nitrous oxide, nitrous oxide is actually very economical. Uh, but yeah. one of so, the problems with what again, is, nitrous what? oxide is is hypoxia. Okay, it will accumulate. It will accumulate. Yeah. So after some times you so will need to percentage. Sorry. So what should uh, be the disturbed. percentage of oxygen to nitrous? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. What, what should be the concentration of to uh, oxygen percentage wise in uh, low flow? It, it doesn't matter. It will accumulate whether you use fifty percent, you use thirty percent, it will accumulate. So the the yeah, the yeah. lesser of nitrous oxide use, it will probably take longer to actually equilibrate and uh, you know accumulate, but it will start accumulating. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. So even if you use 50-50, so if even if you, I think uh, with low flow anesthesia, 50-50 is fine. Uh, you're not looking yeah. at uh, the uh, thing. It will it will accumulate. You have to have the uh, you know monitoring of oxygen. You will yeah. actually see that you can actually go to hypoxic levels very quickly if you do not keep your eye on your yeah. FI. That's the disadvantage. If you don't have these monitors, you know it becomes difficult. Yeah. yeah. So you yeah. can have all thank calculations. You, you, you can be the best mathematician <laughs> still. I think it's it becomes a very tedious. I think that's the reason why uh, people are reluctant to actually go on high uh, the low flows, and they say, okay, fine, what is yeah. there if there's some amount getting wasted in the atmosphere? Yeah, okay, but at least they are safe. They're not going to have a hypoxic patient because that will mm -hmm. cause damage to the patient. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Thank you very much, sir. So there is a question. Uh, uh, in short surgical procedures, daycare procedures, uh, can uh, low floor anesthesia should be practiced or because it will take time for? Uh, uh... No, it depends on the duration. So even if you say if you have an hour's uh, case, then I would actually go for a low flow. Right. But it's like 10, 15 minutes, you know that you need that high yeah. flows for, for five to 15 time. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Then there is no point in actually trying to, you know, right. minimize that. Yeah, by the time you reach then it's time to wake up the patient. Yes, yes. So that's not, but if you even have one hour, so even if you do short cases like, you know, the arthroscopies, I use low flows. Yes, yes. So once um, the patient is there, then it can go on low flows. And the other advantage of low flows is that patients do wake up quicker as well. Yes. The washout yes. is also quicker. Yeah. Yes. So from low flow going and so washout is quicker, patient wake up very quicker, uh, quickly. Yeah. Yes. So you can, like I said, so it depends on duration you're expecting. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Yes, I just check. Hello. Yeah. Uh, so there is a question from Dr. Kernar from Nasik. In yeah. cardiac, we need to disconnect the circuit when the surgeon demands lungs down. Yes. When reconnecting again, do we need to change the flow settings? Again? Absolutely. Because by uh, it's not because it's just not for a second. It is actually for a few minutes when they actually have disconnection and then you are actually going back. You have to increase the flow. You can't, you can't actually keep on the low flows. So your patient will actually uh, wake up. Any more questions? Um, I don't know, but there are actually ways of, I think, um, you know, um, when you disconnect, if you actually have some sort of system where you actually just seal it off uh, for the time, then maybe you don't actually have to go that high of flows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. for the time being. Yeah, the <laughs> gases are going in and the bag is going up <laughs> again. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone wants to ask? Sir, we had almost 140 to 150 people attending yeah. uh, here on Zoom, plus uh, the YouTube channel live streaming is going on, sir. On YouTube, advantage is they can actually start at any time and then continue. So they, yeah. whenever they start, they start at the beginning. So yes. at whatever level you are, so they can actually watch us. Yeah, like I said, I try to actually simplify, took away all the complex equation, which actually scares people. I uh, try to keep it uh, simple. Yes, sir. Uh, um, it's not like said. Uh, I think when people are actually buying uh, the workstation, they make sure that at least these things are there within that Mo monitoring. The gas monitoring, internal CO two monitoring. You know, this this should be essential part and then you can actually practice any kind of anesthesia then and the cost now the cost i think probably of these uh, have come down significantly yeah we are uh, getting based on rental sir we can just order the leads yeah. and the machine comes free yeah so, so that, is, can... that is the, been a model for a lot of equipment where they say that you can actually they will give you machine if you use X number of uh, like these uh, electrodes or use uh, X number of say, even for say, uh, you know, bear huggers, you say you use 100 bear huggers a year, take the machine free, keep it free for that time. They will obviously take it back if you don't use them. Yes. <laughs> uh, so that, that marketing is there. Like Desflurane, these guys will, would give you the vapor of free as long as you <laughs> use X number of bottles a year. So um, this has been been there for, I mean, even UK follows, a lot of places follows that kind of system. 
Uh, this again is uh, more important if you're using Tiva technique alone. Uh, for so that was one of the, when you look, uh, you know look at the uh, uh, NAP six I think it was uh, which they looked at awareness and in that uh, they've seen that the incidence of awareness is minimal because everyone monitors at least in UK everybody monitors the Mac. So as long as as long as the Mac remains uh, between 0.7 and 0.6, they should not sleep at 0.6. They don't remember anything. Yeah. But as long as you keep it more than 0.7, and that's what the AG by guideline says, that is age adjusted. So problem will happen with if you don't actually change the age. So most monitors are actually set to age of around 40 years. And the younger patients uh, can require uh, you know higher Mac. Where is it's opposite in the older patients? Older patients, for the same concentration, you can actually get much higher MAC in the elderly patients. So you can overdose the elderly patient with volatiles. So it's only for younger patients where you want to actually keep the concentration on the higher side. Uh, patients who are abusing drugs, patients who are alcoholic, you know, they tend to require slightly higher MAC. It's similar to when we started using ETCO2, we realized we are overventilating the patient. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Same thing. And if you actually, and if you start using BIS monitor, you will realize that even with 0.7 MAC, you actually are in the deep stage of anesthesia, right? Yeah. And if you do that with blocks and that, you will find that your BIS is like around 30, 35. You can actually go down to 0.2 of sevoflurane. And still, they, so they are asleep. So we are actually keeping them sleep well. Okay, so that's not a problem. Uh, but in certain cases, we can be using overusing. And same thing with ventilation, yes. I mean, we tend to, we want to be ventilate the lungs nicely. <laughs> squeeze, squeeze, come on. <laughs> and they wash out CO2, so yes. And so when people are actually saying the CO2 is reducing, they're probably ventilating too hard. <laughs> So there is a question uh, in the beginning whether a peep can be given. I mean, uh, maybe they want to ask whether peep uh, timing of peep uh, we should give initially only or yeah, always from the very beginning. So if you want to prevent, especially, so you need to understand that uh, if you look at the physiology, okay. Yeah. So anyone at age of forty-five, the closing capacity exceeds the functional residual capacity, and the lungs right. will start collapsing. So if you're actually having a patient who's going to lie flat and he's more than 40 years, start mm -hmm. giving PPAP from the very beginning. Yes. Right. 60 years, above 60 years, they, they start having collapse even in the sitting position. Mm -hmm. Okay, so always either have them sitting up, uh, induction always at slightly sitting up. It not only helps in maintaining the functional residual capacity, but also prevents aspiration as well. So, you know, don't need to actually have patient completely flat. Yeah, sit yeah. them up a bit and apply P from the very beginning. And even with like spontaneous ventilation, you can actually have the APL valve to five to 10 centimeters. I can show you where I actually uh, have videos where yes, sir. you can actually keep the peep to around 70 and still patient yes. will be breathing fine. No yes, leaks, sir. nothing. Yes, sir. Yeah. Any question? Any more questions? No, looks like we cleared all <laughs> doubts. <laughs> yes, sir. And well, you can least... always, like I said, you can always ask a question on the group anytime. Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much You're for welcome. such a wonderful and giving us your valuable time. Yes. And uh, we had almost one, 150 participants at one time. And uh, I hope uh, now we can, because of the corona and COVID conditions, people have slowly switched over uh, from the main circuit to the open circuit and we have put our foot down uh, mm. even in the smallest setups for workstations yeah. so yeah. now the hospital owners are asking us whether uh, you know what kind of workstation yeah. so yeah. this was a lecture uh, to open up uh, uh, yeah. the concept yeah. and yeah. so we should know what we want from our uh, machines you know yeah. uh, so that the so, safe anesthesia yeah. without awareness. Yeah. No. The machines are becoming, like I said, very complex. Okay. And to me, I think I want to have a robust machine, but I don't mind actually having a lower end machine 
Uh, but I want good monitoring. That is monitoring. my uh, take on it. Yeah. So I don't want a high five machine. Anesthesia part of it. Mm. As long as it allows me to actually deliver uh, flows less than one liter, that's fine with me. Okay. And uh, able to, but I should be able to monitor the oxygen, able to measure carbon dioxide, able to measure the antidote CO2 and antidote anesthetic agents. Those are more important to me. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So Sir, can uh, is... machines be upgraded to this without uh, yeah, yeah, why changing? Not? Why not? To, yeah. I mean, yeah, there are monitoring I modules think, to be attached. Modules yeah. 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 And more complex ones now actually also have uh, airway pressure monitors, you know, uh, uh, flow volume loops, you know, yeah. those things. And Most of the machines uh, come with this now. Yeah, yeah. Ventilators are actually a lot more sophisticated. They say allow you almost like uh, the, you know, IT ventilator kind of settings. So if you got patients who is actually asthmatic COPD, then you can give pressure control ventilation. You know, you can do that. Uh, so I think uh, these these are, I think, essential things. I think cost should, it doesn't mean that just because the machine is costly, that's going to be good. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you need to be able to integrate the guys who are actually saying, you said, Fine, I don't want your uh, fancy display monitors and things like that. Give me machines which actually are robust, uh, service is good, but I want these monitors should be part of the machine. Okay. Yes. Mahirish, any more questions? No, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, should yeah, we continue? Well, then? It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure actually uh, interacting yeah. with no, all of you. No, this was our <laughs> first CME, yeah. sir, uh, of this year. Uh, so you have inaugurated. Hopefully, we have many more. We are planning uh, twice in a month. And yeah. Thank you, sir. So academics, uh, beginning of academics for our branch. And on behalf of ISA Kalyan, sir, uh, I thank you uh, so much on behalf of all the delegates also. The, we have had uh, delegates from all over Maharashtra and in fact, all over India uh, to join you, sir. Thank you. And thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Shah Madam, do you want to conclude? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Shall I uh, end the meeting? Yes, yes. Yeah, we can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye. bye. Good. Ah! <laughs> Bless you all. <laughs> hey, we, we will stay for a minute or so before we disappear. Then. Yes. yes. <laughs> huh? It was Again, a pleasure. Yes, Don't sir. go. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. See you. Bye. Yeah.